So we want to start uh, today with meditation. I am not going to be dealing with the, with the kind of meditation, for example, that might be practiced in India or in China. I'm going to be specifically dealing with Christian meditation, and in particular, Christian meditation on the scripture itself. There's a Latin phrase that you'll run across in one of your readings. It's called meditatio scripturarum. Meditatio scripturarum. It's simply meditating upon scripture. So that's what we're going to work on for at least the next two classes. Meditating upon scripture has to do with learning to listen to the text. Learning to, the lis learning to listen to the text. It's as though there's music in the text that God wants to sing to us. Music in the text that God wants to sing to us. But if we're uh, moving too fast, we won't hear what God is trying to say in the text itself. The first line, if memory serves me correctly, the first line in Richard Foster's book, uh, Celebration of Discipline, when he deals with meditation, is this, quote, in contemporary society, in contemporary society, our adversary, the devil, majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. Noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us occupied with muchness and manyness, he will remain satisfied. End quote. Let's think this through. Noise, hurry, and crowds. So let's deal with this issue of noise, for instance. What's the noise level in your life? And you say to me, that's not fair. Eastern is a noisy place. My life is noisy. Uh, a way to get a gauge on this, for example, would be when you get in the car, does your hand reach out immediately for the radio? Second question, uh, why, well, we ask the question, well, how hurried am I? How busy am I? And I would think every student at Eastern University would say, I'm plenty busy. I'm taking 17 or 18 units. I've got a part-time to full-time job. I've got mean-spirited professors. They're all combining against me in a perfect storm of hurriedness. Noise, hurry. Why hurry? What's the relationship between hurry and meditation? It's this. You can't hurry meditation upon scripture. Hurried meditation is a contradiction in terms. Uh, what meditation upon scripture is, it's a slow-paced reading of scripture that emerges out of a wise-paced life. A wise-paced life. So meditating upon scripture or meditation itself is not something that we sprint through. It's not something that we hurry through. It's something that takes time. It takes time. It's actually a gift to us to slow us down. And what this discipline helps us to do is to learn to live a paced way through what life brings us. Paced. Paced. Not hurried. There's a real difference between the two. Quiet. An internal quiet at times. Not simply noise. Learning to slow down and quiet down enough where we can hear God speaking to us. And in particular, speaking to us in a text. Key principle, God is not a screamer. God can do fairly dramatic things to catch our attention. But for the most part, God is not a screamer. God whispers rather than screams. He nudges rather than grabbing us by the front of our shirt and just shaking us. Although he can do that if such is required. Noise, hurry, and then crowds. Now on the crowd part, that's, a, that's kind of interesting that Foster tossed that one in. Crowds. On that one, you might uh, ask yourself the question, 
how reliant am I upon other people for my sense of well-being? How do I feel emotionally when I'm by myself, when there's no distractions? And uh, for most of us, as, as we learn how to move into uh, silence and solitude and meditation, we'll feel uncomfortable when we're by ourselves because there tends to be a lot of stuff in our lives and that will bubble to the surface if we're not distracted. Now catch this. Meditation is designed, purposely designed by God to force us to see the heart of the matter. And it's a discipline that, that, that uh, strains out of our system our reliance upon distractions. Distractions that keep us from facing, for, for instance, what needs to be faced. So there is something demonic about noise, hurry, and crowds. Those are three words worth memorizing. Now I want you to look at a bibl biblical text with me. Turn over to Luke. So Luke writes this, verse 38 of uh, Luke chapter 10. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary. Now, both Mary and Martha are very strong women, deeply loved by Christ. They become deep friends of Christ. But they're very different. They're very different in terms of their personality. Martha is very concerned that Christ feels welcomed in her home, and she's doing what is expected of her culturally. Mary is doing the cross-cultural thing here. So we have Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, he is surrounded by men. The apostles are with him. And none of those men are happy with what Mary is doing. In their culture, she should have been with Martha, preparing a meal, making sure that they were fed and at home. And there is a, there is a, a wonder about Mary here. She knows who she wants to listen to. She's able to distinguish at this point between urgent things and important things. And she wants to listen. So what she's doing here is moving against the grain of her culture. And she's sitting at Christ's feet, and she's just listening because she's never heard words like this before. And not only so, she senses that she's welcomed there by him. Verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. So she's commanding Christ. Tell her to help me. Tell her. Now. Now. Stop your teaching. Tell Mary to get up and come back and spend her time with me. In verse 41, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. So apparently, this is going beyond simply the preparations for the meal that day. She's worried and upset about many things. Maybe that's why she's moving so fast. Maybe that's why she's so active. As long as she stays active, she won't have to face what's worrying her and what's uh, causing this anxiety to rise up within her. Verse 42 is really good. I love this. But only one thing is needed. Only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Only one thing is needed. But you remember this film, City Slickers? With Billy Crystal? It's one of my favorites. And uh, Ortberg turns to this film and writes this. He says, in the movie City Slickers, Billy Crystal plays a confused, dissatisfied 30-something character with a vague sense that life is passing him by. Jack Palin's ancient, leathery, wise to the ways of the world, a saddlebag with eyes, 
asked Crystal if he would like to know the secret of life. Remember that scene? It's this, Palance says, holding up a single finger. The secret of life is your finger, asked Crystal. It's one thing, Palance replies. The secret of life is pursuing one thing. Purity of heart is seeking one thing. It's very interesting that uh, in this chapter, Ortberg talks about purity. Purity. He talks about what a pure person is characterized by. Here's one way to think about it. A pure person is a person who's unmixed. An impure person is a person who's, the word that uh, Ortberg would use, I want you to know this, is duplicitous. Duplicitous. Or the noun is duplicity. Duplicity. D-U-P-L-I-C-I-T-Y. Duplicity. See that D-U at the front of duplicity? That's a prefix that means two. Two. So a a duplicitous person is not Jack Palance in City Slickers. Because he's he's seeking that one thing, yeah? A duplicitous person is a person who speaks out of both sides of his mouth. A duplicitous person is a person whose behavior changes depending on the peer group he or she is with. They're like a chameleon. Their color changes according to their environment. Their life doesn't ring true because they're trying to simultaneously live in two different worlds. So a pure pure person is not somebody with a long list of rules and regulations about what purity looks like. A pure person is a person who knows what she's about. Her, Her life and her words fit together. She's one piece, one piece. And we sense that authenticity. I think that, I think that in that sense, Jesus was the most human, authentic person who ever lived because his words and actions always fit together. See, if we, if we don't learn to deal with noise and we don't learn to deal with hurry and we don't learn to deal with crowds, We're going to have a real problem at this point, distinguishing between urgent things and important things. Uh, A really uh, helpful uh, exercise would be something like this. Uh, Take a, a sheet, draw a line down the center of the sheet, and then in one column, list the urgent things. And then in the other column, list the important things. Identify those important things. Now, here's what's interesting. Save your journal, and 10 years from now, go back to that journal. Which column will have changed dramatically? Well, the urgent column will have changed dramatically because there's now there's other urgent things. But what's surprising is the important column will remain relatively stable. Relatively stable. And if we invest the majority of our life in those urgent things to the detriment of the important things, life's just hell. It doesn't make sense. Because we're wired for the important, we're not wired for the urgent. And the failure to distinguish between the two is the source of deep human dissatisfaction and unhappiness. Psalm 1, if you don't have Psalm 1 with you, or a Bible with you. Note this text. So the psalmist, the very first psalm, blessed is the one who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of mockers, but his, her, delight, block letters, her delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Meditation fundamentally is a form of delight. It's not boring. It's not meant to become some kind of a law in our life. It's a form of delight. It's a way to walk up to the feeding trough and stick our nose down and and our 
teeth around food that we need so desperately. So desperately. With the result being a life that makes sense. A life that changes. <laughs>